Hi, I'm Scott Lewis. I am on the Education Public Outreach Team at Cosmo Quest, and this is our star party for February 3rd, the uh, Hand Egg Edition, because there's no, there's nothing else going on tonight. <laughs> so, there's the universe. Yeah, there's the universe, which is more important than um, some animal skin and big men in spandex. You know what? Each other. You know what? I like football. I'm just gonna put that out there. So you can like hate. it. Don't hate it. But it's not football. Skin. It's hand egg. It's and hand I'm listening. Hand egg. Hand egg. Shaped like an egg. They use their hands. Okay, Very, I rarely think you need do they to get use your eggs feet checked. and balls. You need to like get your eggs checked because if they're pointy, I feel like this is a problem. I don't have eggs. I'm GMO a eggs. This is, this is a new uh, introduction. Is the the pointiness gene? What? <laughs> so while we're getting everything tweeted out, I'm gonna move my view on over to Dave. Okay. And uh, David, why don't you go ahead and tell us what you're looking at here? I I have a very twinkly view of Castor in the constellation of Gemini right now. I thought I would start with something a little bit different tonight. I was showing some people this in uh, at a star party last night, and I was like, you know, I bet I could just get this to the webcam. So this is a bright double star, one of the better double stars in the northern hemisphere to aim at. And Stewart's electric screwdriver just got. Hit. <laughs> Sorry, Stewart. So yeah, when you're you're looking at at Gemini like from the northern hemisphere, so this would be the uh, the two heads are Pollux and Castor. The heads of the twins, Castor, would be the one on the right. So, and I this guess is, if you look closely, it's actually a double head. Yeah. Maybe. What, so the cool about Castor is it's actually a sextuple star too. It's, hmm. uh, each of those two stars are double. They're spectroscopic double. And then there's a pair of red dwarf stars that orbit. I think it's about 10,000 AUs out from those. You can see them in the eyepiece, but you won't be able to see them with this webcam. It's not. Uh, it can't resolve something that big. But there's actually six stars in this system associated with it. And wasn't this also the featured system in uh, the movie K-Pax with Kevin Spacey? <gasps> oh, like, yeah! I, was it? I love that movie. Yeah. That movie is really fantastic. <laughs> that's, that's good to know, because when I wrote a blog about Castor, I was... Sometimes I try to look to see where any of these stars have been mentioned in science fiction. And I remember I was just reading the blog again tonight, and I was like, you know, I can't ever recall Castor being in any science fiction movie. Now I'm going to have to watch k pat tonight while yeah. you're know, my taxes. <laughs> I'll have to change awesome. that blog now. <laughs> we'll check, Touchdown check, Niners. Check IMDb. Wait, really? Really? Really, really Stuart? Really? really? Touchdown Niners. I will really? boot you Whoa, out of this hangout. Oh, this is getting close. I want, okay, so Berman is officially wrong. <laughs> With All right, this. so I'm going to go around and make, <laughs> uh, introduce our astronomers since we're talking about space and not leather. Leather's part of the universe. It's star stuff, too. Okay. It's highly so. processed star stuff, but okay. But I guess we are, too, technically. So we've got Dave down in Florida, and uh, we have also here Gary. Say hi, Gary. Hi, Gary. Hi, Gary. Gary's <laughs> over by me, actually. He's over here in L.A. And we also have Mike Phillips. Hello, everyone. From North Carolina. Right, and right. I might skip the pink-headed one and go on. No. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> this is Nicole Gallucci. What up? I Hello. just got back from Science Online 2013 in North Carolina, which was a fantastic conference. Uh, and you will hear more about it later from us because we had so much fun. Yeah, rub it in. Thanks. I'm sorry. And we also I love you. have... <laughs> We also have Roy Salisbury. Hello. Hi, Roy. And we also have Stuart Foreman. In the San Francisco 49er Bay Area. And you can get booted soon. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> kind of. Kind of kidding. Uh, no. And we also have Thad Zabo. Hello. Dr. Thad. Dr. Thad. No scarf, though. No scarf? You need the scarf. It's L.A. It's not, not cold enough for a scarf tonight. It is not cold Next enough. Next weekend I'll be in Joshua Tree. It will be cold enough. So Yes. yes. Actually, I, might, I might be joining you on that. I need oh, that would be awesome. So. Yeah, we'd love to have you out there. Yeah. So we're going to move on and, and take a look at what Gary's showing us. What do you got for us, Gary? This is uh, the Orion Nebula. This particular one is a uh, two-minute exposure, uh, bin two-by-two. And uh, I also just did another one, which was a 10-second exposure. If you look at, uh, let me get the mouse over where it's supposed to be. 
this area is completely blown out. So I'll bring this one up. And uh, what was Orion doing? It's so blown out. Uh, we don't talk about that. Okay, that's right. Nicole's gonna miss that joke, and it's be great. <laughs> and this is a 10-second exposure. Oh, okay. So you can see the uh, start to resolve the triangulum in the center, which is very bright stars, and Thad knows all about this, so he can tell you why it's so bright. So yeah, we've we've got some new baby stars in there. Although again, as babies go, these are enormous. The the one star in there is estimated to have about forty to fifty times the mass of the sun, which means its luminosity is more than a hundred thousand times the luminosity of the sun. So if the sun is a hundred watt bulb that might stay on then in the superdome, no, I guess not. Um, then this star would be like a ten million watt bulb as far as the uh, the amount of energy it puts out so um, so let's see so that's providing a, a, a lot of energy to, to the hydrogen gas around there and gets it to glow very brightly and of course because of the way the eye works when you look at the Orion Nebula through a telescope you can make out both the, the bright stars in the middle as well as the filaments of gas extending out to the edges the way a CCD camera works is entirely different so you can either do the two minute exposure that Gary had before where all of the the center is just quenched with light or you can do a 10 seconds exposure like we're looking at now where you the outer portions become extremely faint but now you can start to see more of that central portion where these very bright stars are. Yeah, that's really awesome. Uh, it's one of my favorites actually even though we know that it's Nicole's favorite too. Mm -hmm. And I think she probably, oh, and she's gone. Awesome. But no, the Orion Nebula is really great and, and it's something that's you can see with with your naked eye, but if, especially if you get something small like binoculars, so you can get some really good detail going on, especially up in Joshua Tree, like we were talking about, which is out in no man's land over here in L.A. Yeah. So we're going to move on to Mike. And what do you have for us, Mike? So uh, um, I'm a first-time virtual star party with my digital SLR. So I am awesome. working desperately here to, to get the... Um, a Horsehead Nebula, which is near Orion, and uh, I think you can see it there, but I can probably bring it up in uh, one of the other views that I had a little earlier that looked a little better here. Uh, I think this one was pretty good. So, is it uh, decidedly a little bit more difficult yeah. using that DSLR than your typical webcam? Yeah, there's a lot more... Um, there's a lot more variables, I think, is, at least for me, coming from the other direction, I guess. Uh, I think it's hit the trees for me already. Contrast so, is looking uh, good there, though. I think, yeah, if I, if I had you noticed the reflection nebula there. And this is, so I, I, I don't have a modified camera either, and I picked a kind of a difficult target just because it was up, I guess, for me. But it's in the hydrogen alpha, and my camera not being modified is not very sensitive to it. But I always, you know, I always enjoy seeing the little chess piece in the sky, I guess. Mm. So yeah, if you were going to look for this on, on your own, first of all, I don't know of, of anybody who's ever been able to pick up the horse head visually. It's, it's such a faint, right. faint uh, nebula, that, and it also hangs off of an extremely bright star. So the very far eastern star in Orion's belt called Alnitak, if you come due south from there, there's this little dagger of, of red light from this hydrogen gas, and the horse head is superimposed. On top of that, it's pure. It's really just a, a photographic object because your your eyes just going to get kind of washed out by the the brightness of of Alnitak, the first magnitude star that would show up in the same field of view. And also with Mike's view here over to the far right, there's a reflection nebula. So I always point this out in my classes because you you have an emission nebula, that red hydrogen glow that forms the backdrop for the horse head. And then you have a dark nebula, this dark molecular cloud in the shape of the horse head superimposed on it. And then you also have a reflection nebula, which is essentially dust, and will scatter the uh, blue light from the, the star that it, that it uh, surrounds there. So it's a nice little trio all in one place. Yeah. The trio. Are you, are you just playing with the levels there, Mike? Cause, yeah, yeah I'm, I, it's, this is, a I think, a two-minute grab. Okay. And it, I, I, you, it's really hard to see it in anything less than that, and uh, I'm having trouble guiding here. There's a small breeze. The weather's been a little iffy lately, so. 
really kind of climbing the learning curve here, I guess. As far so as what, what are you doing differently then? Since, you know, especially for those that are new to watching the virtual star party from, from um, the SIO conference, many people got turned on to Google Plus and the virtual star parties. But um, what would you guys say is the difference, the main difference of what Mike's doing now as to what you typically do? So, well, for me, so this is the same telescope that, that I use for most of the planetary work that I bring. It's my home-built 14-inch Newtonian, and I took the color filter wheel and the, the planetary camera off, and I put that into an off-axis guider, so I'm using the same camera to to do mount corrections and, and guiding. I think we've talked about that on again and off again, but it essentially takes some of the tracking and periodic errors out of the mount by centering the star automatically for me. And then uh, in the main part, the imaging camera is replaced with a Canon digital SLR. And so you, you open the shutter up and you leave it there for a long period of time. In this case, it was three minutes. And the sensor soaks in what light it can see from yonder. And soaks it up. Right, and then uh, and so we look at really a static image that I took, you know, as we were talking about Gary's objects. So very nice. Yeah. So it's different, and you know. Have, in, go ahead. I was just going to uh, move on and just show that uh, sure. our buddy Ray is here as well. Hello. Say hi, Ray. Hi, Ray. <laughs> hi, Ray. Hi, hi, Ray. <laughs> Where's Egon? You you we stole that Egon. from Gary. <laughs> you know, I've always been waiting for the rest of the Cosmo Quest Scooby Gang. Like when I mess something up, to go, "What did you do, Ray? What did you do?" I will. Now that, that I give you guys, I, now I that you've I said it, on a platter. <laughs> totally consider doing that. <laughs> so, so, just checking out some of the. Oh, sorry. Uh, no, just no, checking no. out some of the questions over here. Somebody's asking if you can actually see changes in the uh, Orion Nebula. This is from Death Guitarist 12. Right. But, um, let's see. So the thing is, no, not in the Orion Nebula. It's, it's 1,500 light years away, and if you were to take pictures maybe over the span of, say, 100 years or so, you might be able to see them. Um, something that might show changes, for instance, though, is the Supernova 1987A, that pictures that were only... 10 years apart showed a significant change in the, the supernova remnant because supernova remnants expanded about one-tenth the speed of light away from uh, the supernova where they, ha where they happened. Or another case would be a nova explosion, which was uh, Monoceratus V838. Nice. That, that one you could actually see changes over the span of a few years as you know, this gas rushes away from uh, mm -hmm. where it exploded out from. So. You can also, if you have really, really high angular resolution um, radio interferometry, uh, you can see superluminal, yeah, I know, superluminal motion, um, superluminal in quotes, it's not actually going faster than the speed of light, it's a whole geometry thing, um, but uh, there are blobs of, of material moving away from supermassive black holes that you can see that actually change over the span of just years, which is pretty cool. Thad, maybe you could let me know the difference between a nova and a supernova. Mm. Okay, so let's see. Yeah, so Nova, I mean, of course, comes from Latin for new, and the idea is they thought, okay, well, here's a new star, but there's there's nothing actually really new about it. It's, except, it's an exceptionally old star, a white dwarf, that's left over when a, a star with less than eight times the mass of the sun dies. But if it has a companion, say, a binary system, and the white dwarf is there, and the star nearby is now a red giant, the white dwarf can steal material from the red giant and as it settles on the surface of the white dwarf and gets kind of thicker and thicker it can reach a point where it suddenly undergoes hydrogen fusion and so it flashes very brightly and the the this gas shell that was kind of around the the white dwarf uh, will increase the magnitude of the star or I guess decrease to be to be more proper about it decrease the magnitude of the star by about six or seven and that'll last for a couple of of, uh, of days uh, possibly weeks so, but a supernova is going to be the case when you have a massive star undergo core collapse, or if a white dwarf completely obliterates itself. And in this case, the change in brightness is in the factors of tens of millions to billions, um, or the change in luminosity, I should say. Um, you can get one star that glows as bright as, as a whole galaxy. So, white dwarf going nova, the white dwarf's still there. If you, if the conditions are right for a white dwarf to go supernova, no, it's obliterated. It's it's not there anymore. Much bigger explosion and um, visible from much much farther away. 
So, so whether super. So yeah, and it's yeah, it's but, but no kryptonite involved. No, no kryptonite involved. No. <laughs> like mega and ultra. No. Got to keep crystal. adding onto it, right? <laughs> well, I mean, there's hypernovas, right? There's the idea right. of if you have a massive star where you start to have uh, strong, like strong enough radiation in the center that you get pair production. And so it starts creating matter antimatter pairs in the middle in the core collapse, and those are those are predicted to be even brighter than a, a typical supernova. So, and I forget where the cutoff is for masses between uh, core collapse supernova and uh, and pair production hypernova. So, yeah, me neither. I forgot to. <laughs> but actually, real quick, um, to you know, since we're about 20 minutes in. Uh, just a quick reminder, to everyone, that if anybody has any questions, please feel free to leave comments in the event page below us here on Google+. Also, uh, over on YouTube, where this is streaming live, if you are watching us on the CosmoQuest viewer or anywhere else and you feel you want to tweet us, go ahead and use the hashtag star party, and we'll be checking on those comments. Um, any requests, as long as they're up, we will try to get those requests taken care of. And we have our wonderful astronomers here to answer any nerd questions, I mean science questions. And, we'll and, and a team. little bit of football. Just a little. No, no. Please. Hand egg is not for this one. Scott, I have um, uh, M42 here that's in color, if you wanted to compare Ooh. it to what... Uh, that is pretty. And yeah. so, so this was a one-minute exposure at ISO 1600. And unlike Mike, I do have a hydrogen alpha um, modified camera. Uh, so it does pick up a little bit more hydrogen alpha than, um, uh, than non-modified cameras. And I'm trying to get the horse head right now, but it won't be nearly as good as Gary's is what he has uh, up at the moment, but I'll see if I can tweak it. And I have a couple others that are that are sort of piling uh, that are that are getting. I'm ready to show here. I found the Eskimo Nebula and and then a, a couple clusters, which I'll show you when you're when it comes back around to me. Oh, it's, it's still I'm loving the, the the color that's coming out of there. Stuart looks great. Yeah. Stuart, yeah. my wife is going to have a rather unfavorable conversation with you about me going off and buying an H alpha filter for my DSLR. Oh, you, it does. It's you can actually modify it yourself. <laughs> oh, and well, I was so, thinking for punching through the uh, the light pollution to the west um, because I've got a really bad light dome from uh, oh. being southeast of Phoenix. Oh, well, then, so if I just did everything in H alpha, then I could just punch through the light pollution and get oh, beautiful images. No, for, for that, but. for that, you're going to have to actually buy another camera, and so. I think I'll have to talk to your wife about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least I'd stop stealing her DSLR, you know, and uh, and start using mine. But there yeah, go. it's a beautiful image. Oh, thank, oh, I just switched over to the Eskimo uh, Nebula there. Ooh. <laughs> so, the Eskimo. So tell us about the Eskimo. So it's a planetary nebula, so much, much mm. smaller than your typical emission nebulae. It has this nice, very kind of roundish structure as the gas kind of gently over thousands of years floats away from what was a red giant and you have this exposed white dwarf in the middle that's getting that, that gas to, to glow that way. The color is from ionized oxygen. So this is a, a layer of, of oxygen that's around this, uh, this white dwarf. The extreme heat of the, the newly formed white dwarf gets it to glow um, with this pretty blue color. So, Pretty blue. Yeah, yeah, as opposed to a massive star which goes supernova and just <laughs> obliterates That's everything. So. This is a very slow and gradual death of a star. Yes. Very and similar the, to what ours will be doing, right? Yes. Although it's it's doubtful that ours the the white dwarf left from our sun will be bright enough to really or strong enough to really get a, a planetary visible from a from a distance. You, you're well, that's talking, disappointing. I know, you know. <laughs> I want our death to be awesome. Freeze yeah. and wait for five and a half billion or six and a half billion years, and then oh man. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> I hate the ending of this movie. <laughs> just cut her out. <laughs> Love hey, it. for those who are interested, uh, I just wanted to jump in real quick. I've uh, pulled up Stellarium, and to show where the Eskimo Nebula is in relative to the night sky, it's sitting there in uh, Gemini. And uh, if we flip over, you can kind of see I had it up. I lost the uh, targeting reticle. So there we go. So that gives you kind of an idea of where it's at. I think uh, everybody can see it okay. I'm going to flew over to Jupiter. 
here. So awesome. uh, my, my, my Yay, image will be Jupiter. clear for a bit. I just wanted to start off with it's easier to find Caster before the show, and then Jupiter I can get like in a in a moment. Nice. Oh, that be that would be great. Love to get some Jupiter in. But we're gonna move on over to Gary. And with the horse head that we've been going over tonight, but oh man. Yep, this is in uh, my hydrogen alpha light because I just can't take regular light pictures here. The sky is too bright. Right. Yes. This is, uh, but this, this is, is... A two minute in hydrogen alpha. Can okay. we just rename it the My Little Pony Nebula at this point? No. Because every time. Yeah. <laughs> Yay! Okay. <laughs> oh, no My brought... Little Ponies. You know what? You what? know what? The NRAO renamed the Manatee Nebula. I think we should rename this the My Little Pony Nebula. Although I don't have nearly which as much pony? clout as Tanya does, but that's okay. Which, which pony, Nicole? Twilight Sparkle, of course. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Twilight Sparkle, He's been, been working on that one for a while. When's, when's the next IAU meeting? I guess we could bring this up on the last <gasps> day or something, get people to vote. Yeah, when it. everybody's... Yeah. <laughs> 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 Wow. I, 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 I'm, I'm Grumpy Cat. No. <laughs> you are Grumpy Cat. No. You don't like my, my pony obsession. That's okay. No. <laughs> but in, in, Gar in Gary's picture of uh, the, the horse head, and you can also see the flame nebula um, just Ooh. below the bright star. The bright star there is the far eastern star in Orion's belt. That is Alnatak or Zeta Orionis. And um, so the star you can easily see. Just go walk outside. Even from L.A. or New York, you can see that. But the nebulas, no, uh, that you need uh, photography for. So. Yeah. And actually, a comment here from Mitchell, from Mitchell Duke, Mike's neighbor. Uh, what is the the focal length for the horse head, Gary? Um, my focal length. Yep. Is that what you're asking? Yes. Mm -hmm. what's your I'm, I'm at uh, about 700 millimeters. Um, f one f uh, two, one actually 1.9. So about 700 millimeters of focal length, 720, 730, I think. I had it here somewhere, but I lost it. Yeah, Gary's shooting with Hyperstar, so or Fast Star, so that way he's replaced the secondary mirror on his his Schmidt cast and, and with a, a lens and can plug the camera straight in to, to kind of the way similar to, to what a, a Schmidt telescope would do, and gets these really wide fields of view that can encompass all that you can see here. So. Yep. So, so I basically got a 700 millimeter f2 lens. So for our non-optically inclined, as far as knowing what we mean by all these optics, as far as focal length and ratios, what, what do we mean by the focal length or an F2 when we're talking about that? Okay, so I mean, a telescope is essentially going to be, you know, a lens or a mirror, and as the light is coming from these very, very distant places, it, it passes through that lens or hits the mirror and then comes together into a focal plane so you can see this image. And so <clears throat> the focal length is just, well, how far is it from the center of the lens or the mirror to the place where you get the image. Um, the focal length is, or the focal ratio, sorry, the F ratio is if you divide the focal length by the diameter of your lens or mirror. So F2 means that the light travels only two times as far as the diameter of the, the mirror um, before it comes to a focus, and this gives you very wide fields of view, fields of view, as opposed to I would imagine the the setup that Stewart is using is probably like typically about f10 or so. <laughs> uh, no, I'm I'm at f7. You're at f7. Okay. F7. So, but that's also why Stewart gives us these these you know tighter fields of view and can pick up things like the Eskimo Nebula, which is much much smaller in the sky than say the uh, the Horse Head. So, and Nicole just flashed an equation up there that's. You know, For yeah. those of you that are algebraically inclined, <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. D. I guess it's a big D for for diameter, but whatever. <laughs> yeah, focal length divided by diameter, and that gives you your f ratio. And so when you hear camera people or telescope people talking about that, you have a way better picture. Awesome. Well, and for anybody who wants to do this, a little bit of experience on my part. Uh, the fast f ratio is much more forgiving. I mm. tried it at f10, and getting things positioned, tracking, everything is very, very critical for long exposure photography. Uh, with the faster lens, the, high, the lower F ratio, it's a lot more forgiving. So a clod like me can actually get good pictures. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's one of the things that I noticed with, with my telescope being at F4. It, it is a lot more forgiving than, than some of my friends who image at like F11 and F12. They've got to have their 
set up just just perfect, and any tracking errors or periodic error in their telescope mounts can really cause serious issues. Whereas mine it can be just a little off and still get some pretty good results because of the fact that you know I'm collecting so much light, I don't need as long of exposures where those errors can magnify themselves over time. Yeah, and the other piece that I've noticed at this is the focus is much more critical. So if I'm doing uh, an exposure over a night, I'll have to refocus three or four times during the night to compensate for temperature change. Oh. But the other hand, with a short focal ratio, you don't need very long exposures. So I, I still remember like the night after I got uh, the, the first night I was shooting with the, the Hyperstar, which took the focal ratio for my scope from F10 down to F2. I shot like 11 or 12 different objects and spent about maybe half an hour, 40 minutes with each one and, and got really great data on a whole bunch of, of stuff in the, the summer Milky Way in one night because it's no longer just, hey, let me take in as much data as I can from one object because I need a lot of it because of my long focal uh, length here. It's, all right, I got this, and then you move on. Oh, I got this. And, and so it, it's perfect for things like the, the star party here. But speaking of longer focal ratios, let's Dave's got this great uh, shot of, of Jupiter right now. Yeah, I use an F10. This uh, plus round C8 is an F10. Seems very turbulent out here because once I get a focus, then it kind of it goes blurry again. I think we've got so much radiational cooling from from the daytime that it's uh, it's very turbulent out here right now. It's a clear night. But yeah, there it goes. Plus, we're aiming over a bunch of houses right now, so they're all giving off heat. And right. Jupiter's so getting a little lower than it's been. Yeah, I was about to ask how far above the horizon right now is Jupiter. Yeah, it's probably about maybe 60 degrees above the horizon. Oh, I think I see what it might have been. There was a contrail from the jet. It actually had a jet pass through the view, and uh, <laughs> through, it looked like it went it went blurry for a moment there. I think that's what it was. Silly airplanes yeah. messing with your astronomy. Yeah, that's nearby terrestrial phenomenon. That was looking great. Yeah, you can see the banding on there. Yeah. Yep. Loving it. No Never red once. spot again tonight. And every once in a while, you can see how the air settles down, and yeah, you get this this very crisp view. So this is this is a very good replication of what you would see looking through the telescope at Jupiter. Um, the fact that you know sometimes it's extremely sharp, sometimes it it gets really wobbly. It looks like somebody's put a barbecue grill underneath it, and you're getting the waves of heat coming up through it. That's essentially what seeing is. It's these differences in temperature and density, and it, it causes the light to bend, and you get your image to kind of wobble and wave a little bit in response to it. So, um, There's a cool way you can demonstrate that. Um, we may Actually, we should probably do this for one of our learning space hangouts, but if you get a, a clear you know, uh, container of water and shine a laser pointer through it, and if you have some like cool water in there, and then you pour in boiling water, uh, mm. and 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 you know once it's settled, you you can uh, actually see the spot of of the laser pointer jiggling around and moving around, just like that image of Jupiter is because of the temperature density differences that refract the light. So that's a, a cool way to do it at home and actually see how seeing and turbulence work. I might have to do that for my classes this semester. Yeah, thank yeah. you. And you got to pour it slowly so that you know. It's not the actual movement of the water, you know, being right. sloshed in. It's it's actually the temperature. That same oh, fifth magnitude star that was near Jupiter last Sunday night is still there. Uh, Omega Tauri, I believe it is. It, it looks kind of like a like a fifth moon off to the side. I noticed it in the eyepiece looking at it. No, I'm loving so, it. Thank you. So I have the 37 cluster here. Yes, the 37 cluster. The now seem to be famous 37 cluster. Seem to be famous. I see it. I see it this time. If, if yeah. Do, yeah. Do you? I, I oriented it correctly. I, <laughs> I love I, you, Stuart. Thank I you. cropped and oriented it this time. <laughs> so uh, so you'd see it better. Thank you, Stuart. I'm visually challenged. Oh, it, it's funny. Um, <laughs> later, either probably either tonight or tomorrow, I'll be releasing a video from Fraser's talk that he gave at SIO. And, well, it's um, already live. Um, on this from the SIO website, right? Right. Yeah, you can get the uh, for the full hour session of the Converge. I went oh, okay. and edited it down of just his talk. But yeah, going over, uh, he was sharing the the thirty seven nebula and Nicole going, oh, I see it at the very end. <laughs> She's yeah, like after like, everyone has moved on. Right. <laughs> I'm a little late. 
so, so what's going on here? What it, obviously these stars Chance. are not perfectly aligned in, in the number of a thirty-seven. No, this this is actually called I think NGC twenty-one sixty-nine, if I remember correctly, and it's um, uh, it's an asterism. If you wait five or six years, it'll be the forty-two cluster. And, uh, yes. <laughs> So or the ultimate cluster. Yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, typically when you, you discuss a, a star cluster, you're talking about a group of stars that have formed together and are, are gravitationally bound. And I'm not sure that's even the, the case here, or if it just happens to be kind of a, a random alignment. I, I think I think it's a asterism. I think it's just a complete random alignment. Okay. So. Yeah. Hey, Stuart, I think you've yes. got the NGC number right. I've just pulled up that NGC number that you quoted out, yeah. uh, 2169. 20. I yeah. just pulled that up in Stellarium, so... Um, everybody should be able to see that popping up. Uh, looks similar to what you've got on your screen. Oh yeah, it yeah. should. <laughs> <laughs> if we've if we've got the right NGC number, yeah, that's yeah. kind of what I was thinking when I pulled it up. Was yeah, that's got to be the right one because it looks a lot like what you got. That's it. No, that's really great. That's so, what do you got for us, Gary? Uh, I got the Rosette Nebula. <gasps> and the Fraser's not here for it. Sorry, Fraser. <laughs> no, <he's not. laughs> That's what he gets for going is, off uh, and doing science stuff. It is. This yeah. is, again, in hydrogen alpha. This is a two-minute exposure. And I can zoom in a little bit, and we can look at the uh, some of the dark lanes. And here you've got all kinds of neat dark nebula. This one's fun. Yeah, uh, it's just gorgeous. It's, it's, I just you know, love the complexity of it and how, you know, how beautiful it is being able to see it. You know, <coughs> And the occluding, the the light coming through, but no, it's, it's 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 one of my favorites too. It's not my absolute favorite, like Fraser, but it's something that's it is beautiful. And interestingly so. enough, pretty much everything I've shot tonight is in a very small area of the sky, right around Orion. Yeah, it's an extremely rich region of the sky, and it's, it's um, looking out. From the Milky Way, it's it's looking out toward the edge from where we are. So if you if you take the Milky Way as a as a as a disc of some sort, right? And so here's hey. the, the center where the yeah, actually a CD. <laughs> Who even a has disc. these anymore? Right? So um, so the center would be where the supermassive black hole is. We're way out, about two thirds of the way out on the edge. When you're looking at the constellation Sagittarius, then you're looking towards the middle, and in Orion, you're looking out towards the edge. So the stars are much thinner, the Milky Way isn't nearly as bright, but fortunately from where we are in the uh, in the galaxy here, we've got all these really cool objects out in the, the direction of, uh, of Orion. So. Absolutely. And I, and I have a question here from Sean. I'm actually glad that you are able to pull this up, Gary. Um, but said, what is the trick to finding Fraser's favorite Rosette Nebula? I currently have a manual EQ mount with a 150 millimeter achromatic refractor. Would I be able to find the object with this size of refractor or any recommended filter? So, he also has a narrow band filter as well. What size again? 150 millimeter. Okay, so it's about a six inch scope for those of us who are metrically challenged. Um, <laughs> let's yeah, that see. sounds about right. I mean, my eight inch scope is 200 millimeters, so. Right. You know. Basically, start at, uh, at Betelgeuse um, and go about one fist's worth. If you have your, your, your fist extended at the end of your arm, that's about 10 degrees. You're going about, about 10 degrees to the east. The rosette is over in that region. Um, I don't know if you'd be able to see any of the nebulosity with the naked eye. It tends to be pretty faint. Um, but uh, the, the rosette is in that area, and also the cone nebula and Christmas tree cluster are also right in the, the same area. They're, they're very close to each other in the sky. So, And you can also use this handy tool that we're using here in the Virtual Star Party called Stellarium, and I've actually got the rosette nebula up and kind of uh, showing a little bit of what Thad was talking about here, where you can kind of star hop from a few notable bright stars like uh, Betelgeuse, or you can use uh, the stars in Orion's belt to kind of navigate your way through and, uh, you know, screenshot this or grab a Stellarium. It's freely available and download it, install it, and you can kind of use it to give yourself a little bit of an idea of where to star hop from. Your, your, your screen keeps to be flashing a lot, Ray. It's your refresh rate I'm not sure. That. I'm not sure why it's doing that. Mm. Okay. It's cranky. Just, just want to make sure. It's never done this before. <laughs> Google Hangouts and Whack a Mole. <clears throat> Whack a Mole, yes. So, so we'll just turn Mike, that off. Mike, have anything up? Oh, there we go. What do you got, got there, Mike? Well, I managed to uh, 
<laughs> fail out on a couple of the harder targets that, that Gary's got here, so which is all right. So we got coverage on the Rosette. I, I, I saw some of the dust lanes, but it just it didn't look right, so I'm on M36 right now. Okay. So this is an open cluster? Yep, one of the many open clusters in Origa. Yeah, so yeah, that's of, like uh, open cluster territory. Totally. I, I'm back. Sorry, I had to watch fourth down. Fourth down. What's the score? Uh, uh, four. Ha ha. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> wait a minute. Wait a minute. I'm wow. kidding, Stuart. You can unmute yourself. Wow. Um, I, I do have the Crab Nebula, though. See, that'll make up for it. So you can put <laughs> the score. Oh, Marty in the Crab Nebula. You can join if you like. Thirty-four, <laughs> twenty-nine. See, I would. Thank I always root for the referees because they never win. Wait, thirty-four twenty-nine. Wow. Is that an NGC number? What object <laughs> is that? Yes, that was a request I had uh, in my chat. Or BLT. Room, yeah. It's the Raven Bleeding Nebula. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Is nice. that in Corvus? Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> Blackbird. <laughs> Oh my goodness. So you had the crab nebula, Stuart. What's oh, your yes, uh, Yeah, I've got I've got the crab. Okay. Um and uh it's I'm actually pretty happy with it. This is a a two minute um uh, exposure that I um that I cropped a bit, but uh, you can kind of see some of the wispiness in it. Mm -hmm. And oh, yeah. um yes. and a little bit of the the redness in it. I mean, I see I, color. Yeah, you can see a little color in it, and that's you know it's kind of cool. I'm normally you take sixty minute exposures of this, and so this is this isn't bad for a for a two minute exposure. And it's a great contrast with having the the Eskimo Nebula up before. Again, a planetary nebula um, left over when a less massive star dies, and the death is kind of gentle in comparison to a supernova, so you get this rather spherical structure with the planetary nebula. This is a supernova remnant, so 950, 960 years ago when this appeared in our sky, it was visible in broad daylight for a month or two, and now, you know, from our point of view, 950 years later, this is this bleh all over the sky from this, this and massive That is a explosion. technical astronomical term. It is. <laughs> and it it's, is. It's, it's right it's immediately over. after supernova, the term is bleh, bleh. Bleh. No. Yes. forty vowels <laughs> to constant. I think the guys from Monty Python invented that one. <laughs> they have a castle where they observe, and that's the castle. Of bleh. Bleh. <laughs> now for the comfy chair. No, that was the castle <laughs> arg. There's no blah in there. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Somewhere well, in we're cave. not British, so. Oh my god. <laughs> Yeah, there's oh, got to there's got to be a friends. you know U G H at the end of there somewhere. So it's yes. U G H, right? So U G H. <laughs> oh man, we're incorrigible, incorrigible. Oh, no. I'm still tired from Sino. You can't do this to me. I'm, I'm still going back to David's view of, of Jupiter. I, I purposely overexposed it off to the side oh, so you can see two of the moons. Yeah. It looks like there's. Uh, I, I tweeted out the orientation of the moons from uh, Starry Night it's earlier. Out the moon. uh, really? It looks like uh, we've got two on each side. I don't know which ones are on what side, but it's like I, I think it's like Io and Europa on one side, and Callisto and Ganymede on the other side. Somebody tweeted a link with the configuration. Of, I did. Yeah. I did earlier. Oh, you did. Okay. <laughs> yeah. It might have been, or somebody might have been retweeting moons. Yep. Yep, I did that for my own benefit. I always check to see. I was hoping if we'd have some. Uh, we haven't had any shadow transits during a virtual star party that I've done anyway. Mm -mm. Uh, yeah, the, the timing's just off for them. I mean, there there was one during the the night. The there was the conjunction of the moon and Jupiter back on. I guess it was the the twenty first of January. Um, but that was a Monday night. So, but there was a nice Europa and uh, shadow transit. I got I got some pictures yeah. of. So. We're going to be entering into, I think it's July, Callisto starts doing shadow transits. Callisto doesn't always, uh, doesn't always hit the disk from our vantage point. It, it's uh, tilted just enough so that yeah, it, it misses. Just a little bit. Uh, I think it was 2003 or 2004, I actually caught three shadow transits at once. Uh, once oh. or twice a decade, you get something, you, you get where I've never, I don't know if you can have four. I don't see why you couldn't, but I've never seen four. It's just the rare, most, yeah. The most right. I've seen was three simultaneous. For about 10 minutes, all three were on the disc at once. I think it was 2003. I'd have to look it up again. Probably. Quad transit of 
Saturn um, a few years back, which yeah. was pretty rare. And I think Hubble got a really good picture of that one. I, yes. I've tried to do, yeah, I've tried to see shadow transits on, I've never seen them on Saturn. There was that one brief period around the equinox when yeah, you right, right. didn't see the rings. It was fantastic. Yeah, for like 10 months, I think, Titan was, was making regular shadow mm -hmm. casts across the globe. But you know, now it's opened up tremendously. So. Those are much tougher to do for amateurs. <laughs> Yeah, and so I mean the the difference here is the way that Saturn is inclined. It's the way its uh, its axis is is inclined to the way that it goes around. It orbits the sun. For Saturn, the the tilt is something like like twenty five plus degrees. So I think it's actually it's about twenty seven degrees. So every fifteen years, this tilt so that Saturn is appears to be edge on, and then we get the uh, and then we get the the other pole for the mm -hmm. the next fifteen years. So it's only during that very brief time where the rings become invisible that you actually get shadow transits. For Jupiter, the tilt is only about three degrees. And so you get like Io and Europa and, and, and Ganymede having shadow transits all the time. But I, I guess what's coming up now will be with Callisto. Um, those are only once every six years or so that yeah. the orientation of Jupiter's equatorial plane is, is right for, for Callisto to um, cause eclipses in Jupiter's atmosphere. So. And we always love eclipses. Yeah. Always fun. So going over to, to Stuart, what do you got over there, Stuart? Um, this is uh, a cluster in Orion. Let me just pull it up here. It's NGC 1981. This is the running man? Um, is that what this is? Um, hey, I definitely sort of don't like, see that. I, was, I don't think it is. I was sort of hoping you would let me know a little bit more about this. Um, because you're an astronomer, <laughs> <laughs> and astronomers know everything. Everything. <laughs> Do the everything. Yeah, I mean, you, you're the professional astronomer. Hang on, yeah. uh, let, me, let me pull it up here. Um, no it's, it's, I, I got it. It's one degree north of the Great Orion Nebula at the northern edge uh, of the NGC 1973-75-77 complex. Uh, the bright scattered cluster contains 40 stars with a half a degree area as a few stars of sixth <laughs> magnitude with most seventh to ninth. And you actually see a little nebulosity in there as yeah. well, which is what yeah. I was sort of hoping that you would you would teach that, me about a little bit. But it's that probably, is, oh, go ahead, yeah. sorry. No, that's, that, that's it. Yeah, that's I, that. That's the Running Man Nebula. So, and the Running Man Nebula, it's, it's with... Um, Again, typically longer exposures, you can see these kind of dark lanes, this silhouette on top of the reflection nebula there. So the blue there is, is a reflection nebula, and there's there's kind of uh, um, the silhouette of supposedly the running man in front of it. I think we were discussing this. Um, there was some time when somebody was calling it like the the guy shanking somebody else nebula. It almost <laughs> looks like he's holding a knife and like stabbing at somebody the instead of a nebula. So... I think but, that was um, another pony. Everything looks like a pony to you. <laughs> <laughs> so, but yeah, I think somebody, I there, if you go back on one of the, the threads, I don't know if it was just Virtual Star Party or uh, something a bunch of, of, of uh, astrophotographers jumped in on, somebody actually drew the outline of where the Running Man silhouette is in uh, MGC 1981. Um, but yeah, I think somebody else said, well, it looks like he's wielding a knife. Because so, we're all such people here. He's got a knife. So violent. It's a pony it's a wielding a knife. knife. That's what it is. Maybe it's a carving knife. Mm -hmm. Could be a carving knife. Maybe Whittling. Not. Then we need the pumpkin nebula or a jack-o'-lantern nebula nearby, right? So. <laughs> <laughs> so, Mike, what do you have up? That is awesome. Yeah. So I'm pushing the limits of my uh, setup here. This is the Eskimo nebula. Okay. A little okay. bit longer. Sure. So what we were looking at earlier with Stuart, so yeah. what we're doing here with yours now. And now let's let's go into a little bit of difference between your telescope and Stuart's because they're not the same telescope by any stretch. No. All right. So um, I have a small refractor, um, uh, and Mike's got a very large reflector. Uh, mine's a 140 millimeter refractor at f7, and Mike's uh, he can tell he can tell about his optics. I think he said it was f4. Um, yeah, four and a half. And yeah. So it, it, it's a, 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 an 18 megapixel camera, so the, the power is actually fairly good. I can get to, I think, half of an arc second per pixel. I just washed my mic, sorry. And so even though it's 
you know, I'm wow. kind of like in between, I guess, Gary and uh, you know, the, the planetary setup here. No, and, uh, I can pull the other one up and get a longer exposure. It's great seeing you being so versatile, jumping out there. But yeah, it's, mm -hmm. and so what like uh, Stuart has there, he's using a lens for his optics as opposed to Mike, he's using mirrors. So he's reflecting it, and the light for Stuart's setup is refracting. It's actually banging through to his eyepiece. Oh, I remember a discussion about the Running Man Nebula. That, yeah, it was either it was a knife or a gun, and we were calling it the Liquor Store Robbery Nebula. <laughs> oh, wow. It. Yes. I'm I feel seeing, like I'm back I'm home seeing, in Detroit all over again. <laughs> I'm seeing comments that the Ravens won. Really? I, I was going to mention that, but I thought he would, I would get muted again. Uh, I just I'm, want to acknowledge. Well, I mean, I don't care who won. I'm just, I'm well, I'm just out. checking the news here real quick to seeing who won the game. Um, and the Puppy Bowl! Like, it looks like, oh, I don't see which team. Oh, I'm sorry. Wrong big game. I'm sorry, guys. That's that's my mistake. Everybody wanted me to pull up. 31. I'm, I'm sitting here in the backyard, and I can hear shouts from all the other houses, so I think the game's over. <laughs> yeah, I'm not, he I'm not hearing any shouts from my houses, which is I'm on the other side of the country here. So Everyone's crying. Everybody's kind of... And we're yeah. looking at space, yet still talking about it. Um, <laughs> yeah, to me. Why to do me. you hate the sports ball so much? Uh, actually, ball. you know, Scott, what do you got against ponies and puppies? And football. Everything. I'm, I told you, I'm Grumpy Cat today. You are Grumpy, grumpy Cat. <laughs> but if you like yep. science and are okay with football, you should check out the hashtag CyBowl2013. I know Phil played and a bunch of people were yes. putting out some interesting science-y factoids that were sort of related to the Super Bowl. So that, that kept us entertained as well. Yeah, Phil threw out a lot of uh, uh, tweets that I, I saw earlier this evening about the Super Bowl, like a perfect football throw and other mm -hmm. cool stuff. So, yeah. Awesome. There you I go, Scott. Yes, he... Comment over here from uh, Douglas Allen asking about, you say that is the crab bleh, nebula. <laughs> now, actually, that will apply to any supernova remnant. But, of course, you say the veil nebula, and that sounds kind of nice, as opposed to the veil bleh, nebula. <laughs> right. Or maybe we should just tack it at the end of nebula. Well, right? And at we'll that point, it sounds like... Only supernova remnants, though. Only, only supernova, supernova remnants. remnants. Only supernova remnants. Mm -hmm. Yes. Because right. that makes it sound like a really nervous bride threw up at her wedding. Like, not about the veil blah, <laughs> nebula. <laughs> oh, oh. Yeah, that's well, right. Actually, actually, let's just combine it. Let's just make it nebula. 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 <laughs> <laughs> oh man. No, let's not. Let's not revisit that Super Bowl ad, Nicole. <laughs> that's exactly where I was going. I love it. <laughs> we will totally never get the keys to the virtual star party ever again. <laughs> <laughs> we turn this into half an hour. What's that? We're done. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm going home now, kids. Yeah. <laughs> so actually, let's head on over to Gary and take a look at what he's looking at. This is something I wasn't sure that I could get. This is called the Teardrop Nebula. Hmm. And the star in the upper left is Mintaka, which is the right hand in uh, Orion's belt. And just off to the lower, let's see, where am I? Just off to the lower right here is the center star, uh, Al... Al Nilam, Al, never mind. Al Nilam, something yeah, Arabic. You. So there Mintaka, Al Nilam, and Al Natak. And there's a mm. lot of nebulosity in this area, and I think what they're calling the uh, teardrop is this right here. Okay. There's oh. A whole okay. bunch of clouds in that area. I wasn't sure if I could get that. That's a two-minute exposure. Oh, that looks Ooh. great. Yeah, that would be pretty tricky. I mean, that's uh, another nice job here. But I guess teardrop for all the Niners fans out there. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, sorry, Scott. But on a non-football related note, if, yes, no more if my, an egg, please. If the fragments of Astro 101 that are still left in my head after all the astrophysics I've learned are correct, if I remember correctly, a reason why a lot of the stars that we see in the night sky have names starting in all is because of the fact that they were charted by Arabic astronomers, and all is actually Arabic for the. the. So all the exactly. stars that we see in the night sky that are all this, all that, all this, all that, they're actually the they, something. They're all that, man. They're yeah, they are all that. That's, what, that's why we're looking at them. Right. So but, uh, I've together, often joked that uh, together. intro to Arabic and intro to Greek should be mandatory for astro people so that we know all our Greek symbols and that we know what all the names of the stars mean. Oh, you learn the Greek symbols in your math classes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, that's true. 
<laughs> well, it's it's the Deberon and and the Natak and the Boreo and the Tear and the Ferrats and so. Wow. So it's kind of like <laughs> Spanish. El Dorado, the Dorado. So. El Pollo so, Loco, the crazy chicken. chicken. <laughs> Where are you going with that? We're so okay. not getting the keys back. I'm sorry. The, the crazy chicken is that by like Cygnus and uh, and uh, Aquila there. So <laughs> Pollo Loco. No, too. it's Camilla. There is a chicken nebula. There is a There's chicken yes. nebula. Camilla, I miss Camilla. So Gary, what do we I have here? Actually, actually, we're looking at David. Dave's right now. Oh, okay. Astro guys, we're back on to Jupiter. It's, I'm still loving it. You know, we're we're able to look at all these amazing. You know huge deep sky objects, but then we're also able to look at the largest planet of our solar system too, something that's still fairly close to us, and now it's jumping around. Like a crazy. little bit of thin clouds, yeah. Mm. Just a little bit of thin clouds, but it's still kind of burning through. Oh, I'm still loving it. And kind of thankfully, as far as virtual star party goes, Jupiter and Saturn are kind of diametric, di almost diametrically opposite each other in the sky right now. So as we start to lose Jupiter, come March or April, Saturn will start to be uh, start showing up there. I was, I was I was looking ahead. Yeah, it's around lucky for us. Late, late late March, we should be able to start get, getting Saturn low in the east. Then we'll be losing Jupiter. Maybe it's jumping up and down because the sun and the clouds are jumping up and down and being bloody weather. Yes. <laughs> yes, they are. More Monty yep. Python. Yep. <laughs> stop that! You stop that right now! Stop it. Let's just not get in the knee. Yeah. Monty Python, <laughs> ponies, and football. That is this week's edition of the Virtual <laughs> Star Party. <laughs> ecky, 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 paying one, zoo boy. <laughs> <laughs> what is Gary looking at? I want to know. It's just a model. I won't tell you. <laughs> yeah. So you know, Gary, we're gonna wait. We're gonna sit here in silence. All right. All right. We're gonna, silence. I'm gonna turn this universe around. If you I must will. know, this this is Thor's helmet. Ah, That's right. And um, I can see that one. one. <laughs> <laughs> this is a fun little object. I think it's got another name too. Let me see if it. Uh, Pointy helmet. Now I, now I lost it on my uh, star chart. I, I, I like that. This is also in the Orion region of the sky, correct? Yes. yes. Yeah, it's a little uh, little lower on the horizon. Uh, we're down. Um, so it? more, just more of that rich nebulosity, I guess. Then that's in the plane of the Milky Way. Is that mm -hmm. what this mm -hmm. is all a part of? Can we get the immigrant cool. song going with this one? So. So, it's Thor's helmet. I mean, we, we need other like Viking references to go we with. We should it. have Viking it's, references. Oh, Viking a lot of, <laughs> a lot of other nebulosity off here to the, uh, to the yeah. Right of the image. Yeah, see that. So There's yeah, I'm not sure where exactly this one is in Orion. It's in the the southern region. Is this? I know the like the witch head is down by Rigel. So it's, uh, the opposite side. It's near Sirius. Um, so between Sirius and, and um, Safe, I guess. Yeah. Sirius and Lucinda, almost dead between Sirius and Lu Lucida. Okay. And speaking of Sirius, we've been so serious this entire <laughs> virtual star party. Serious business. We have fun when we do science. We huh? do. It's okay. It's okay oh. to have fun, Grumpy Cat. <laughs> I I am Grumpy Cat. <laughs> Scott needs a hug. I, I've had a very long week. <laughs> no, I'm going to get yelled at. Frazier is going to yell at all of us. No, no he's not. No, not no, all of no, us. No, he's not. Some no. of us. <laughs> no, not going to happen. Not going to happen. <laughs> Actually, James Hanning points out, Frazier Kane will be pulling out his hair when he watches this one. <laughs> yep. About as much as I can pull out my hair, though. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, now, Mike, is, are you are you up for the night? Or is this the square nebula? Or the <laughs> it's a square nebula. There is a red square nebula, but this is not it. <laughs> it's a red square nebula. The asterism that I found in the... Uh, yeah. uh, lost in my windows here. Uh, okay, I'm going to go back to the source of the Eskimo moment. Nebula, and I was trying to get a better tracking on it, too. So like it's uh, it's okay. a longer exposure. Yeah, the red square. I mean, that's a, is that a planetary 
There's a red square and there's a red rectangle. I think they're actually different. Um, but I, I know, I, I, I think one's a pleasure. But it's, it's, it's enough of an odd object that there was an entire conference dedicated just to the red rectangle nebula in Charlottesville when I was a grad student there. Um, I was not at the conference, unfortunately, so I can't tell you much more about it, except that the infrared astronomers love this object. So are, are there any other uh, um, planetary nebula in this vicinity here that I could take a peek at? I seem to have some success getting, you know what, other than just doing Come on, Thad, where's your internal sky atlas? Come on, you're an astronomer. Yeah, I, know. I mean... Yeah, the, es the Eskimo jumps out mentally in this region of the sky. I mean, then you're, you're getting out of the plane of the Milky Way pretty quickly once you head east of Gemini. So, I mean, you start getting star clusters like M67 and the, the Beehive M44, and you're starting to get some good galaxies a little bit farther to the east. Um, yeah, Virgo's starting to come up, too. Yeah, I tend not to shoot many planetaries, though. I just don't have a mm. uh, kind of setup that, that, that does well at that, uh, that size. So, mm. um, so yeah, I'm drawing a blank here. Eskimo, and then, eh, wait until summer. No. Yeah. <laughs> get the ring, get the dumbbell, get, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, those yeah. are the, I mean, her nebula are, are nice, but, you know, after a while, they, they kind of have similar shapes, where something like these star-forming regions that, that we're picking up with right. the H-alpha, you get a lot of um, different shapes. You get a lot of a variety of shapes because it's just being, you know, it's being affected by turbulence in the interstellar medium, not so much just one star going poof. <laughs> the puffball nebulas. The other thing is planetaries are are not nearly as common as the emission nebula because you're really right. getting kind of a moment in, in time after the, yes. the death of this right. star. You wait about 100,000 years and you can't detect planetary nebulae anymore because the gas has dissipated into space so thin that there's no way, thinly, there's no way to, d to detect it anymore. So right. you don't find as many planetaries as you do, say, emission regions. Yeah. Mm. It's a very short-lived phenomenon. Anything that is short-lived in astronomical terms, we see fewer of uh, by default, and that is what um, you know helps shape the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. If you want to <laughs> go deep into Astro 101, HR diagram. Yeah, you see certain lots of certain types of stars because they live so much longer, like you know yellow stars like the sun or or red dwarfs. But you don't see as many of the big bright blue stars. Um, because there are so few, there are fewer of them. They live so quickly. Right. But on the other hand, you can see the, the more luminous ones from a greater distance. Right. Was, somebody was asking me about imaging Proxima Centauri. Mm. And it's like, okay, it's an 11th magnitude star. This is the closest star to us after the sun, and it's more than 100 times too faint to see with the naked eye mm -hmm. because it is such, has such low luminosity. Right. That, yeah, there's a bias that comes in. If you just count how many stars are in the sky, which are of which type, you have a built-in bias because some of them are so much brighter intrinsically than others. Right. Well, I, it's about that time. We've been going for an hour now. Um, unless anyone has anything else that they're pulling up. I got one more I'll have here in about 30 seconds. Yeah, and oh, I've, right. I, I, I got one more, too. I'm working on M33. I'm just trying to get a transfer real quick. Mm, oh, awesome. Okay. Just give me a minute. So while, that, while those guys work on that, Thad, I had a very interesting question when I was doing sidewalk astronomy in downtown Phoenix Friday night. Okay. I was showing off the Orion Nebula and, and actually had a, a really interesting question, and I didn't know the answer offhand, and I really didn't want to whip out my phone and Google it. Somebody was asking what the density of the Orion Nebula was as compared to our atmosphere. Like, they wanted to know if it was, like, a puffy, like, as dense as, like, puffy clouds in our atmosphere or if it was, like, really dispersed. And my gut reaction was to tell them that because it's 24 light years across, you know, it's incredibly dispersed, but because it's so big, that's how we see it. Yeah, that's it. I think Phil Plate had done something on this recently where it's saying, you know, people said, oh, I want to go fly through the Orion Nebula, and you just wouldn't notice that you're flying through anything. That, you know, it's it's just like you said, because we're far enough away that it shrinks it to this relatively small angular diameter, and we, we see all this brightness around. But, um, yeah, I mean, up, up close and personal, there's really not enough material there to scatter light, like the way we would see a cloud in our atmosphere scatters scatters light. The, the density is... Um, if I remember correctly, it's 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 not that much above the vacuum of space. Which yeah, so, and the vacuum is like what one gram per cubic. Yeah, it's like oh a no, couple, it's one particle per cubic meter. Centimeter. Centimeter. About, okay, one particle per cubic centimeter. So. 
You know, so and, and the atmosphere is, how, is, I don't remember what order. It's like 10 to the 16th, 10 to the 17th particles okay. per cubic centimeter. So. <laughs> so, so effectively, the International Space Station is flying through more material in orbit than it would through the Orion Nebula. Yeah, about, yeah, right. sim comparable, comparable amounts. Oh, okay. So, yep. Yeah, so yeah, it's a little bit denser than interstellar, you know, the, the average intergalactic or interstellar medium. Yeah, I mean, like I like I was saying, I knew offhand that it had to be, you know, very, very, very sparse. I just didn't yeah. know the actual like density to put to them. Other than no, it's more like in space than it is in many, our atmosphere. Many, 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 many orders of magnitude below, you know, what we could even get in a lab vacuum. So. Yeah, I mean, the atmosphere of Mars is comparable to the atmosphere on Earth at an altitude of fifty or sixty miles. So you're, yeah, you're you're talking above the ionosphere for getting something similar to the density of, mm -hmm. of a nebula. Okay, I got M33. Can you see it? It's I, I, I cropped it weird, so I'm not sure if it's coming through real uh, well enough. It's a, it's a little fuzzy. Well, yeah. I mean, it's um, it's a two minute exposure, and it's a little low in the sky oh, for there me. There we go. That's much better. Oh, there it goes. Yeah. yeah did okay. your screen just? <laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't know what happened, it. but the. There we um, go. Yeah, and uh, and I I had to put a noise reduction and filter, which was sort of making it a little blotchy. But you can kind of right. get an idea of the of the spiral uh, spiralicity of it. What 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 kind of spiral is this, everybody? Flocculent <laughs> spiral. <laughs> okay. Despite my despite my flickering, um, just pulling this up here on uh, Stellarium. Interestingly enough, as I was talking about in in one of the previous. Uh, VSPs, how we're so creative with our names. Uh, M33 is known as the Triangulum Galaxy, and it's in the constellation Triangulum. So Orion Nebula and Orion, Triangulum Galaxy and Triangulum. You Andromeda know. Galaxy and Andromeda. Exactly. So, yeah, it's crazy. But speaking of good emission nebulae, if you look into the, the lower uh, right quadrant of this picture that Seward has of the Triangulum Galaxy, there's an emission nebula there that is enormous compared to the Orion Nebula. In fact, I think the only thing even nearby us that compares is the Tarantula Nebula in the Large Magellanic Cloud. Yeah, really and so, but again, still, the gas there is really, really thin. So from here, it's this bright knot in this lower right portion of uh, the Triangulum Galaxy. It's NGC 604. It even gets its own NGC number. But it's really thinner, actually, than uh, the air 100 miles, 120 miles above the Earth's surface. And uh, Tom Nath points out that the shock waves from the surrounding stars is just enough to compress the gas into this form that we can see. Um, shock waves from nearby supernovae and, and, and You know, we, we joke about the naming, but I think astronomy is actually really cool because yeah, once upon a time, everything was considered just a cloud, right? Yes, so this, was, this would have been the Triangulum Nebula, Nebula, Nebula the, yeah. the Andromeda Nebula. They didn't realize they were whole galaxies outside our own galaxy. Mm -hmm. right. Thank you, Edwin Hubble. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, cool so stuff. what has Gary got so, here? It looks like yeah, we're going to end it up here with Gary. What do you well, got? This is M46, which is the cluster, but in M46 oh. is the rotten egg. <laughs> the rotten egg. <laughs> oh. Okay. This is so totally going to be the rotten egg version. This is the Rotten Egg episode. The is Rotten Egg it? Hand episode? Is this Planetary Nebula? <laughs> yeah, it is. You know, it, the first time I saw this, I didn't know it was there. I was just after the cluster. Yeah. And it's a, actually that same kind of green color that most of the planetaries are. Right. And it was like, oh my god, there's this little thing inside here. It was like really cool. Green bean is, is, it, is it really called the Rotten Egg though, Gary? Uh, that's what it is in uh, the Sky X. It's also wow. uh, Calabash. Calabash Nebula, it says. Rotten egg. And rotten egg. Pretty I didn't cool. think there was anything rotten about it. It was like it was like a piercing or a tattoo on the cluster. Which <laughs> M is th which is which M is this? M what? Forty six. Yeah. The cluster is M forty six, so it's an open cluster. Right. And then there's this planetary nebula superimposed, which may either be above or I, I don't know if it's in it or just superimposed. In front of it. Right? In front of it? Yeah, it's I would imagine it would have to be closer. So. Yeah, it's, yeah it's, it's, you're right. It says it's most likely unrelated. I'm just looking at the right. Yeah. On, yeah. And uh, it's in pupus, right? Not puppies. It looks like puppies. It's in, yeah, no puppies. <laughs> it's it's in puppies and puppies. Yeah, it's in, <laughs> the turd constellation no. fan. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I wanted to, to thank everyone for coming out on the Super Bowl Sunday. 
Uh, I'm sorry, Scott. Did you say super bore? Yeah. <laughs> I, I could oh my say god! Why am I the only one here who doesn't hate football? Okay, I, I don't know, hate football. I just hate watching sports on TV, Nicole. Let's. Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll clear that up. Right, I will. I will right. go to any live I, uh, sporting event. I hate watching sports on TV. It just, I got my there's back. There's no excitement. I love my football, <laughs> and I just love you guys just a little bit more, which is why I did not watch the Super Bowl. So don't give me any crap. Oh, yes, actually, oh, and Stewart you. is great. I did text him, and yeah, he's like, "No, I will leave at halftime." I consider myself a visual athlete, so. <laughs> 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 I, would totally I, the, those games. I would totally use the applause app to give Stuart applause, no. but Nicole no. will kill me on I, site no, the next time she sees allowed. me. Yeah. <laughs> you are banned from using Google Sound Effects. Oh, come on. They're awesome. I lobbied so hard to get them put into Hangouts. I need to use them. Otherwise, no, the Google don't. guys are going to get mad. No? No, nope. I'm, nope. I'm sure they'll be okay with it. I'm, I'm sure, I'm they'll, sure be okay. they'll be okay. We can use well, troll face. That's fine. Again, I'm going to go through and thank you, everyone, for coming out for all your questions and your comments. Um, again, this is uh, David over here from Florida. Okay. And Gary. Hi, guys. Hi, Gary. And Mike in Pitch Black. I, I saw your your face down there. I Let's was there. The, yeah. It's, it's actually pretty dark here, despite my oh, lack it's of so spooky. SLR skills. Mm. There I am. Hi. The spooky <laughs> nebula. <laughs> And Nicole, thank you for coming in after getting back on your two flights. Meow. <laughs> and we're moving on. Ray? Scott, did you say meow? Yeah, I did. <laughs> <laughs> no, wait a minute. I can't use the effects, but someone else can? I was, I was giving you an opening. I was giving you an opening. How's oh, that? Okay. <laughs> and Stuart, thank you for leaving the Super Bowl party to come hang out with us. My Blimey. pleasure. My pleasure. Dr. Thad, my friend, thank you for showing up. Um, I will text you Thanks later so we can go to uh, Joshua Tree. Get some Sounds good. Can, can, we, can we give Scott around here because he's kind of, you know, trying to... <laughs> we love you, Scott! Thank you for putting up with so much crap from Nicole yeah. and I, and, and that deserves... <laughs> Yeah. That deserves applause <laughs> too for uh, for Ray. Yeah, he's he's... This week. <laughs> <laughs> that has been like oh, oh man. Oh sad panda. I was trying to give him some props here, but he's really working hard. Thank you, Ray. <laughs> yeah, no problem. So, yeah, I, I see <laughs> Emily just, just tweeted us, her friend Emily, she just got back from Sayo as well. Uh, Which Emily? Emily, oh, our there. Emily, yeah, Celix. Hi, Emily. We're being Hi, Emily. completely serious. So, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> All right, everyone. Thank talk. you for coming out. We will see you next week. Uh, Nicole, what's coming up this week with our hangouts for? Cosmic yeah, this Quest? week we have the uh, astronomy cast tomorrow at uh, it's two p.m. Central. I, you can look at the event for more details about uh, what time it is in your time zone. Uh, Wednesday is Learning Space Hangout uh, at 6 p.m. Central. Uh, I still need to fix it, figure out the rest of the programming for that, but I think we're going to do the, um, the the turbulence demo. I think that would be good. And uh, Friday, uh, Thursday is the Planetary Society Hangout, uh, hosted right. by Emily Lakdawalla. Friday is the Weekly Space Hangout, and I think that wraps up our week. So please join us. And Friday, I might actually have something really cool and exciting for the weekly space hangout, and I'll keep you guys filled in on that in the next couple days. So I'll talk to you soon, Nicole. Okay. Oh, all right, everyone. Before we, okay. uh, after we disconnect, Ray, stick around for a second if you would. Uh, I don't know if I can. Um, I might have to catch up with you after the show. Okay. I was just going to say something about why you were blinking, I think. Cool. Yeah, yeah, we'll do that after the show. Okay. All right. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a good Thanks, night. Thanks, everybody. Bye.